Good morning again. We are going to start our session um, until we have um, until we have lunch. It's the last session of the morning. I would like to highlight the presence of some institutions that we have uh, before presenting our host. Uh, we met Francesco De Lillo from EPRIT just a few moments ago on the last session. From the Evangelical Alliance, we have been having the President uh, Timotio Cavacu and the Executive Secretary Josué de Pont. From the Ismaili community, we had Naz Nazrin Kara and Zamira Kurbon Bekova. From the Seventh day Adventist Church, Trans European Division, Jan Sweeney, Dan Serb, and also from Portugal, from this division, Artur Machado, the Director of the Chaplaincy Services in Portugal. Jan Sweeney is the Trans European Secretary, Dan Serb the Irish mission leader. We would like to acknowledge the presence of all these invitees, and I'm going to present now from ADRA, um, who is on the spotlight right now because of the unfortunate earthquake in Turkey and Syria. I think that the last time I said Iraq, so I'm sorry, but uh, sometimes we make some mistakes. It's Turkey and Syria. Some, somebody told me that I did that mistake. I didn't know. From other Portugal, we have Carmen Maciel, the executive director. Welcome, Carmen. Thank, thank you for being with us. And from other Europe, João Martins, that we're going to be is going to be our host and moderator for this session. Thank you, João. Working? Yes. Thank you so much, Paulo. If you don't mind, I will speak from here and I will save the time of going to the mic there. Uh, you are very welcome to the second session of this morning. We are happy to have such a distinguished panel here. It's uh, it's really a privilege for me to be with all of you this morning, and I'm looking forward for what you have to share with us uh, during this, uh, this session. So the title of this session is uh, Religious, uh, freedom of uh, Religious and Freedom of Expression in the Contemporary Society. So we will look at the society today and how the points that we have been discussing um, in the last uh, day and a half interact with it. And as a first speaker of this uh, session, we have, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. John Grass. <laughs> he comes from, from France, also from Switzerland, so in the border. He is uh, the, um, he's in charge of the uh, International Center for Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, um, and he's a former uh, Secretary General of um, uh, I, I, Irla, I, R, L, A, uh, at, at the United States, and so, so it's the position that now Ganun Diop is taking, so it's a, really a privilege to listening to you this morning. The floor is yours, as you will uh, share with us about um, the UN resolution on defamation on religion. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much uh, to, uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I just, you know, you saw that the link between the resolution and defamation of religion and freedom of expression, of course. And I would like just to tell the story of the uh, resolution uh, of defamation of religion. You know, during more 10 years, a 10 years period, the Human Rights Commission had to deal with the proposal of a resolution combating the defamation of religions. It is important to know what the objectives of the main actors were. On one side, the initiator of the resolution, the organization of the Islamic Conference, and on the other side, the European Union, the US, and the most Western states. Some few words about the OIC, the OIC, Organization of Islamic Conference, which became after cooperation. The OIC was a major player in the UN arena, and it gathered 57 member states across four continents. It was established in 1969 and have its permanent headquarters in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the main financer, and Malaysia, Iran, and Pakistan are the leading member states. In 2006, when the Human Rights Commission changed its name to Human Rights Council, the OIC, with 17 members, represented 36% of 
of its member states. They constituted a block of 57 member states at the UN General Assembly in New York. With their traditional allies, they were the majority at the Human Rights Commission and a powerful group at the UN General Assembly. The second actor in this debate was the U European Union, associated with the USA and most of the Western states. They defended the established and traditional concept of human rights they initiated at the origin of the UN in 1948. The third actors was the rest of the UN state members. They were more politically focused. To simplify, the debate on defamation of religions played the traditional opposition between OIC and allies against the Western world and its human rights concept. I will divide my presentation in three parts. The first, the reception of the resolution. The second, the intense debate. And the third, the compromise. In 1999, a draft resolution called Defamation of Islam was introduced to the Human Rights Commission by Pakistan on behalf of the OIC. For the opponent, the resolution threatened the freedom of expression and its hidden goal was the pass of an international law against blasphemy of religion. One of the outcome would be to justify the persecutions of reporters, human rights activists, religious dissidents, and non-Muslim within the OIC member countries. In the discussion that followed the introduction of the resolution, the title, Defamation of Islam, raised the objection of the delegate from Germany representing the European on the title and on the wording. According to him, the resolution gave the impression that Islam was the only religion to face problems and Muslims were the main victim. As we can read the resolution's initiator, first, also, I quote, expresses deep concern that Islam is frequently and wrongly associated with human rights violation and with terrorism. Point three, expresses its concern at any role in which the print audiovisual or electronic media or any other means it's used to incite acts of violence, xenophobia, or related intolerance and discrimination towards Islam and any other religion. In the point four, the draft resolution becomes more concrete about its expectation. Point four, I quote, urges all states within their national legal framework in conformity with international human rights instruments to take all appropriate measures, does it suggest a law, to combat hatred, discrimination, and tolerance, and acts of violence, intimidation, and coercion motivated by religious intolerance. The OIC strategy is revealed without, within these three points. First, to demonstrate that Muslims are victims of grave violations of human rights. Second, these attacks are the consequences of the defamation of Islam. And three, third, to protect the victims, a laws against defamation of Islam should be passed in the country of the UN states member, unit, United Nations members. After negotiation between the European and the OIC, a compromise was found. The title of the resolution became Defamation of Religions. But the European representative noticed that the authors of the resolution, and I quote, 
did not attach any legal meaning to the term defamation as used in the title. That is the arguments the European and the opponent to the resolution will use. Muslims are not the only persecuted in the world, and the term defamation is not in the human rights concept. As revised, the draft resolution did not create too much problems, and it passed without a vote. Even the Holy See did not express its opposition. The point seven mentioned that the issue will be on the agenda the next session. The second part, the intense debate from 2005 to 2010. Every year until 2004, similar resolutions were adopted without a vote under the heading of counteracting the defamation of religions. To justify the resolution, the OIC called official reports on discrimination and violence against Muslims. And I would like just to mention three. The final, number one, the final document on the Durban Human World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance of September 2001. The OIC report on the intolerance toward Muslim in Europe, March 2005, and the report on the three UN special reporters on racism, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, March 2007. The result of these reports was the OIC declaration adopted at its 34th session of foreign minister meeting in Islamabad in May 2007. It asked the Human Rights Council to take effective measure to combat defamation of religion. During this 10 years period, all the resolutions were adopted at the Human Rights Commission and Council and at the UN General Assembly level. In 2009, the positions seems to be irreconcilable, but the support shifted. After 2008, the resolution passed, but the abstention of member states increased. On December the 21st, under the title Combating Defamation of Religion, a resolution was again presented to the uh, UN General Assembly and adopted. However, it confirmed the reality of a shift. The majority of the UN member states no longer supported such a resolution, and the OIC changed its approach. What did happen? Did it renounce to their goal? No, but it had to face three new challenges. The first one, the strong opposition of the Western countries. The second, the oppositions of the UN experts. They all agree with the concept of human rights focus on the protection of the individuals and for them, non-organization or religion are excluded from critics even if critics are not always justifiable. Third, the international context. The terrorist attack in London, in New York, and Washington, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Danish cartoons, the Asia BB case in Pakistan, followed by the assassination of Governor Salman Taseer and Minister Shabazz Bati, the Arab Springs, and these negative messages largely commented by the international media explain probably the number, the increasing number of abstention. In 2011, after diplomatic meetings in Istanbul with the European American, they introduced the resolution 1618 on 
combating intolerance, negative stereotyping, and stigmatization of and discrimination, incitement to violence, and violence against persons based on religion or belief. But to be credible, the resolution had to avoid giving the impression that the OIC lost the battle, which was not the case because they won every time at the level of the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. In fact, the battle was not over. It was not a victory, nor a defeat, but a kind of cease fire. At the 16th session of the Human Rights Council on March 1, 2011, OI, OCI Secretary General called for the establishment of an observatory on defamation of religion at the Human Rights Council. A few weeks later, Pakistan Ambassador Zami Akram continued in his introduction, introductory remarks prior to the Human Rights Council's adoption of the resolution, and he said, I want to state categorically that this resolution does not replace the OIC's earlier resolutions on combating defamation of religions, which were adopted by the Human Rights Council and continue to remain valid. According to Robert Bill, in this respect, support for the new international consensus on combating intolerance represents merely a cynical and strategic decision to continue the campaign to legitimize a ban on defamation of religion by other means. As the ILA, I was the Secretary General at this time, we agree that the OIC concern about Islamophobia was legitimate, even if they don't represent a religious organization. We supported the role of education, interreligious dialogue, and respect of religions as part of the answer. We established a code of good conduct called guiding principles for the responsible dissemination of religions or beliefs, and we invite representatives from religions in all our public events, a way several times mentioned by all in the defamation of religions debate. But we would have liked some sympathy in the resolution for the persecuted Christian and other religious minorities. We disagreed also that the resolution puts on the same level defamation of religions and incitement to hatred and violence. This debate may have clarified the legal understanding of the term defamation, discrimination, and racism, as Blondine Cellini suggested, but when does defamation begin and it ends? Is the resolution on defamation dangerous for freedom of expression? My answer is yes, but provocation should be avoided, especially in the context of political tension. Having said that, I don't want to ignore the cultural and religious factors. <coughs> During our meeting at the Human Rights Council, one of the leaders of the Pakistan delegation took the floor. He came and we were very interested to listen to him. And what he said made sense for me, even if I did not change, he did not change my position. He was a former student of the top, a top US university, and he said, I understand your vision, he said to us, I understand your vision of freedom of expression. And he had, but in my country, 
When someone attacks our religion, it is a personal attack, a personal aggression, an act of violence which leads to a violent reaction. And he added, you talk about freedom of expression, but you also put limits to this freedom. We just ask you to understand that for us, religion is on the top of our value. And he could have add, it was the same for you in the past, but it's not longer the case today. Why? Defamation, an act of violence, the 1618 compromise, because it is really a compromise, does not end the struggle about the universal value of the freedom of expression. But it shows that for billion people, religion could be a matter of death and life. On the other hand, restricting freedom of expression to protect an ideology or a religion will lead to the destruction of an invaluable pillar of human rights and the foundation of our democratic society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent, excellent timing. And thank you so much for your uh, beautifully presented uh, lecture this morning. The second uh, speaker uh, in this session is uh, Professor Jaime Rosel Granados. He comes from uh, the University of Extremadura in Spain and is their prof uh, professor of ecclesiastical law. And he will talk to us about the religious discourse and freedom of expression in our Western society. We are looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank the IEDLR, his president, Mario Brito, and especially its secretary general, Paulo Macedo, and his team for the invitation to participate in this international uh, conference. And secondly, I, I promise to try to keep to the time I have been given to speak about religious discourse and freedom of expression in Western societies. Uh, the fast technological development we are experiencing together with economic globalization and the revolution in the media and social network is creating an increasingly in the interdependent and global social reality. But contrary what, to what it may seem, the society we are building is becoming increasingly conflictive and less secure as a result of the proliferation of a series of conflicts based on the assertion of identity by national, ethnic, or religious minorities. In the press or on the internet, we see more and more examples of fanaticism and intolerance, an intolerance which is returning to our society and where hate speech is becoming increasingly prominent. In this context, we mustn't forget that our model of Western democracy has been built to a large extent on freedom of speech and opinion. As the European Court of Human Rights has pointed out on different occasions, freedom of expression is the essential channel for the formation of the free public opinion, which is the foundation of pluralism and democracy itself, even if the idea shared may be received either as inoffensive, offensive, or scandalous. This is one of the reasons why international law considers that any measure aimed at limiting or restricting freedom of expression or its exercise should only be adopted on an exceptional basis and in previously delimited circumstances and on the basis of clearly identified criteria. Unlike the United States, Europe has traditionally been more restricted of freedom of expression when it comes to protecting rights such as freedom of religion. As some authors point out, this may be response to the historical experience of the 20th century, to the European culture of honor, 
or to the confessional history of most European countries where heresy and blasphemy were a matter for the church, for the church and also for the state. In the United States, example of a model of tolerant democracy, fundamental rights are conceived as spheres of individual autonomy or freedom in which the state must refrain from intervening and remain neutral. Thus, hate speech is only punished when there is a clear likelihood of disturbing the public peace. This disturbance must be proven in each case by applying a test that demonstrate the existence of a clear and present danger or that fighting words have been used without the existence of a potential or abstract danger being sufficient. In contrast, in Europe, an example of militant democracy, rights, in addition to being subjective in nature, are of a benefit nature in such a way that they embody objective values of the legal system, such as pluralism. So for this reason, freedom of expression, which is necessary for the existence of a free public opinion, are limited when hate speech is made because it doesn't contribute to the formation of that public opinion. The tool used by the European Court of Human Rights is Article 17 of the Convention, the so-called Abuse of Rights Clause, and is usually applied against Holocaust di dianalyst speech or certain racist or xenophobic hate speech. Interestingly, this abuse of rights doctrine wasn't initially used in relation to hate speech related to sexual orientation or political speech directed against the constitutional, constitutional order. In fact, the European Court was inclined to recognize a greater margin of appreciation for states in restricting freedom of expression in the context of political speech, even if it was hateful, hateful political speech. In recent times, and as a consequence of this position of militant democracy, the European Court has been claiming the defense of certain common European values, such as dignity or equal rights and non-discrimination, in relation to hate speech or expressions directed against vulnerable groups such as LGTBI community, but it does so by applying, not Article 17, uh, applying Article 10 of the Convention. The question is whether the same standards of protection apply in all states to religious groups as to groups that are targeted on the basis of race, sex, or gender. My impression is that this isn't always the case. On the other hand, legal conflicts between freedom of expression and freedom of religion sometimes arise from the content of certain religious speech that is considered contrary to other fundamental rights such as gender equality, sexual freedom, or non-discrimination. This has to do with the specificity of the discourse which is based on the doctrine of each denomination and which in some cases may morally disqualify certain behaviors or values accepted by society or promoted by the public authorities. These messages can be understood by certain groups as hate speech, discrimination, or violence. They are discourse that seek to influence the believers, but also have an impact on those who don't share the same moral values. The question is whether these groups that feel attacked or harmed by religious discourse must put up with it just as believers must put up with the increasingly widespread secular anti-religious discourse. Part of the content of the right to religious freedom consists of being able to freely explain one's belief individually or as a community. Thus, churches and confessions, as part of the right to autonomy, may transmit the doctrine, not only for the purpose of indoctrination of their followers, but also for proselytizing purposes. This message, unless it is contrary to public order and the legal system, cannot be limited by the state, 
which, as a consequence of its position of neutrality or secularism, must tend to guarantee that religious groups can disseminate their ideas regardless of whether they may annoy, inconvenience, or scandalize certain groups. It is evident that the discourse on many occasions transcends its strictly religious dimension insofar as it gives rise to a political social debate. The religious message is thus incorporated into the circuit of the market of ideas proper to a free, open, and democratic society and will be subjected to the evalu evaluation and criticism of groups outside the denominations in such a way that this message will be transmuted into a political religious message. The question is to determine whether such a message should be treated as political speech and subject to the limits set for freedom of expression or whether it should be treated as the result of the exercise of the right to religious freedom. As some authors point out, for some time, the European Court maintained a different position as to when the dissemination of a message with religious or political content should be restricted, granting them a different level of protection. The Court have subsequently modified the jurisprudence by setting similar standards for both speeches and affirming that both messages shouldn't be subject to particular limits on the exercise of freedom of expression. The European Court will prohibit hate speech when the discourse, whether religious or political, contains violent incitement or expresses hostility or hatred towards the constitutional system, democratic values, the state, or its institution. The question is whether the views of certain groups, in this case religious groups, can be excluded from public debate, or whether the freedom of expression of these groups can be restricted on the grounds that their opinions are discriminatory. And if Europe, example of militant democracy, can restrict the religious message on the grounds that is, it is critical or contrary to a set of democratic values or that it distorts, offends, or discriminates against certain groups. In 2001, Protestant pastor Harry Hammond was convicted of inciting violence and disturbing the public peace while preaching in public with a large banner calling on homosexuals to repent. In 2004, Swedish Pentecostal pastor A. Green was sentenced to one month in prison by a district court in Kalmar on charges of agitation against a national or ethnic group following a sermon entitled Is Homosexuality a Natural Instinct or Evil Forces Playing with Humans? In which he claimed, among other things, that sexual abnormalities are a cancerous tumor deep in the whole body of society. In 2016, three Spanish bishops were denounced by an LGTBI association for allegedly committing a crime of incitement to hatred, discrimination, or violence against the homosexual community by publishing different documents in which they strongly criticized the concept of gender identity. In the case of Pastor Hammond, the English courts only convicted him of incitement to violence and disturbing the peace. Despite the defense invoking the European doctrine in relation to freedom of expression, the English judges of the court, in analyzing the content and circumstances of the statements on the banner, reached several conclusions. Number one, that the words, the words were insulting and created anguish in the community. Number two, that Hamon was aware of the effect his statements would have. Number three, that the state's action had the legitimate aim of preventing or at least containing the public disorder caused by the banner. And number four, that in accordance with the requirements of European law, the measure restricting the right to freedom of expression met the requirement of being a pressing social need. We cannot agree with this decision, which doesn't apply the doctrine of the European Court 
on the limits to freedom of expression and freedom of religion, and which seems to respond not to legal criteria, but to a time and a social model present in the United Kingdom where certain LGTBI groups enjoyed an enormous capacity to influence the public authorities. By contrast, the Swedish Supreme Court overturned the conviction of Pastor A. Green in 2005 on the grounds that the homily fell within the, uh, the, hom the, homily fell within the exercise of the reverence right to freedom of expression and right to freedom of religion, and that the doctrine of shocking ideas enshrined in Handyside versus UK should properly be applied. Similarly, all cases reported in relation to statements by Spanish Catholic bishops on homosexuality and gender ideology were dismissed by the Spanish courts on the grounds that such statements didn't directly incite hatred or violence against homosexuals. These statements, while potentially upsetting to the homosexual community, fell within the exercise of the right to freedom of expression under Article 10 of the Convention, which allows statements of a wide variety of kinds, including critical or even extremist ideas, even if they may be distasteful, upsetting, or disturbing. In these cases, religious leaders, through the exercise of the right to religious freedom, defended a series of moral postulates contrary to those defended by other social groups. By exercising their freedom of expression, they opposed a series of opinions that are currently in the majority in our, in our society or that are supported by the public authorities. But they did so without inciting discrimination or hostility against these groups. Democracy, as I noted at the beginning, is built to a large extent on freedom of expression, which is the essential channel for the formation of free public opinion, the foundation of pluralism and the democracy itself. In this context, a minister of worship must be free to deliver religious speeches that may offend the sensibilities of certain groups or minorities, just as religion must withstand criticism, however annoying or offensive, because it contributes to the formation of public opinion. So civil society must withstand criticism of religious origin. Preventing such discourse from becoming hegemonic or dominant by public authorities or minorities may be considered a legitimate and desirable political objective, but this cannot mean excluding such discourse or ideas from public debate. The public space must be dominated by the idea of freedom, and this implies that there can be a religious discourse critical of certain realities or policies. This is part of the content of the fundamental right to religious freedom of individuals and communities. This criticism must always be presided over by a climate of respect and tolerance for the ideas of others. Attempting to silence or modulate religious discourse as a consequence of certain social convention or on the basis of values defended by certain groups may end up expelling the religious message from the public space, thus limiting the full exercise of these fundamental rights for individuals and the religious groups of which they are a part. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Jaime, for sharing with us these practical cases and uh, excellent presentation. The next speaker is uh, Professor Alexis Arthur de la Ferrière. Um, he, he comes from the um, University of London, uh, the Royal Holloway College, and he will share with us a reflection about uh, the meaning of the establishment today, implications for religious liberty and freedom of expression. 
Thank you so much for preparing this uh, theme for us this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you to uh, Paolo and to Mercedes for having brought us together here today. And thank you to Mr. President of the Association for your invitation. So I'm going to outline a defense, a qualified defense of the established status of the Church of England. And if that's a surprise to you, I, I assure you that I wasn't expecting to come to that conclusion myself. So I'd like to, to work through that a bit. So last week, on January the 30th, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, attended a meeting with a dozen British MPs at Westminster Palace to discuss the Anglican Church's continued refusal to consecrate same-sex marriages ahead of uh, this week's assembly of the General Synod. And this, the General Synod is the Church's legislative body, and they're, they're, the proceedings are going on as we speak. And the General Synod, once again, will debate this question of same-sex marriage within the Anglican Church. Although the meeting behind, uh, between Justin Welby and the MPs was held behind closed doors, details were quickly leaked. And it's alleged, it's alleged that Justin Welby told MPs that he would rather see the Church of England disestablished than risk a schism between conservative and liberal groups in the global Anglican community. Now, talk of disestablishment in the UK is nothing new. Nonconformists in the 19th century, such as Robert Dale, James Rogers, argued for disestablishment on equality grounds. And they, that led to them being labeled as political dissenters by their opponents. In 1869, the Irish Church was disestablished by an act of parliament. The Welsh Church was also disestablished in 1914. And further, the notion of disestablishment should not be equated with uh, a necessary curb on the Anglican Church's religious group autonomy. Indeed, in a recent book, Jonathan Chaplin makes a strong argument that establishment compromises the Church of England's autonomy and its mission in tangible ways. And he urges the Church to itself take the initiative to terminate its established status. So my aim today is not to take a position on the intrinsic merits of establishment or disestablishment, nor do I claim that an act of separation by parliament would impinge on the Anglican Church's religious uh, liberty. Indeed, I tend to agree with Chaplin that that move would deprive parliament of its strongest form of direct leverage over the church. In sum, my aim is not to consider the direct legal and political effect of eventual disestablishment, Rather, my aim is to interpret what the disestablishment of the Church of England would mean today with regards to the place of religion in contemporary society and with regards to the principle of religious liberty in our current moment. Why should we make that distinction between the effect and the meaning of disestablishment? It's because the constituent parts of any social act may remain constant throughout history but its meaning is always defined according to the particular cultural context, the particular historical moment in which that act takes effect. The direct effect of disestablishment today as it pertains to public law and the life of parliament may be little different from disestablishment in earlier times. However, to disestablish the church today when secularism is thoroughly entrenched in society would communicate a very different meaning than what would have been the case in an earlier context, marked by a mus muscular struggle between a still dominant church and an increasingly assertive state vying to rid itself of ecclesiastical tutelage. So first we should think about what establishment means today in the UK. Before speculating on disestablishment, so Julian Rivers has argued that the established position of the Church of England has acted as a constitutional paradigm, securing certain forms of connection in a context in which separation is just assumed, and also ensuring the public significance of religion in a context in which religion is increasingly, appears to be irrelevant. So perhaps counterintuitively, establishment on this account exists in tandem with separation. It exists in tandem with separation as a sort of counterbalance to the dominant assumption of separation. 
An establishment also ensures continued public recognition of religion as something valuable for the entire national community, regardless of the specific affiliations, practices, or beliefs of the individual members of that community. Perhaps the most outwardly visible sign of that connection and that recognition is the person of the monarch, who is also the supreme governor of the church, who is anointed upon their coronation, and if Charles uh, pronounces the same sermon as Queen Elizabeth, is sworn to maintain the laws of God. And the, the monarch's conscience in that context isn't only an individual conscience, but encapsulates or represents the collective conscience of the nation. We could talk about the, the, the controversy over grand, uh, the, the Grand Duke of Luxembourg's refusal to sign into law the, the euthanasia bill in Luxembourg a few years ago. So there's one argument pertaining to the meaning of establishment today. Tariq Madud has made a similar point, but from a multicultural perspective stating that minorities, religious minorities, value the Anglican establishment as it exists today as an ongoing recognition of the public character of religion against what he calls triumphal secularism. Whilst historically establishment certainly signaled inequality between religious groups and the dominance of one church over public life, in the context of secular modernity, Establishment offers a form of official representation of the shared commitments of religious life through the mediation of one constitutionally designated emissary. That was most recently illustrated just last week when the Association of British Muslims wrote to Archbishop Welby to express their concern regarding potential shifts in the Church of England's teaching on marriage. And that's not because they have a vested interest in the convictions of Anglicans, but because they recognize the status and the social role of the Anglican church as established. Joel Harrison goes further down this line of argument, claiming that despite what he calls historical ambiguity, just to put it mildly, associated with its privileged status, the established Church of England, and I quote, offers one central commitment that then supports others, because it affords recognition that the religious quest is fundamental to public life. Harrison's position rejects the liberal egalitarian view that the state should adopt a neutral position with regards to virtue, and that the state should solely guarantee the personal autonomy of individuals to self-define and to pursue privatized notions of the good. Instead, Harrison holds that civil authority is subordinated to something other than itself. This can be understood as a quest for a truly good society. What is the true human common end? How do we pursue goods in common in light of that end? How do we associate well with one another? Such a quest, he argues, may be compromised, it may be contested, it may only be seen darkly, but it grounds us in an alternative to the secular understanding of politics as existing to simply facilitate and to negotiate individual claims of rights. Now Harrison's account is clearly controversial and we may or we may not adhere to it. However, I think what we can say is that the maintenance of the established church in an otherwise pluralistic society is coherent with his account of the state. According to Harrison, the preservation of establishment is not a historically incongruous hangover from an earlier period of imposed religious conformity, although it may also be that. Rather, the maintenance of the established church is an outward sign of the continued commitment of the national community to the pursuit of the good. This is not to say that the nation should converge. There's no expectation that all the individual constituent parts of the nation converge on um, the established church's substantive vision of the good. 
but rather that the constitutional recognition of a church elevates the template of the religious quest in the national imaginary. On this view, religious liberty is not reducible to toleration in a free market of ideas. It is founded on the understanding that religious groups are pursuing a good goal or a good end, and one that is capable of being recognized as attractive and integral to our common life. So against that background, the prospect of disestablishment represents more than just a perfunctory update of the Constitution to reflect the religious pluralism in society. Instead, it signifies a public repudiation of religion as the pursuit of the good. And thereby, it limits the claim of religion to special protection. In the current moment, Parliament is elevating itself to the status of sole legitimate arbiter of the good, whilst at the same time restricting expressions of the good to what Christopher McCrudden has called strongly individualist, uh, individual, individualistic, autonomy-based, anti-essentialist, and constructivist rhetoric. This move is not only anti-religious, but it's also illiberal since on the one side it rejects virtue ethics, and on the other side, it rejects the idea that the proper role of the state is that of a neutral arbiter of a pluralistic civil society. Chris Bryant, MP, has made this position very clear this week, stating that if the church, if the Church of England won't act on same-sex marriage, then Parliament should give it a push. That push might take the form of disestablishment, but MPs this week have also indicated that there are other options on the table. It could take the form of a repeal of the 1919 Church of England Assembly Act, thereby restoring the governance powers over the church to parliament. Other options evoked include stripping the Church of England of its exemption under the Equality Act and removing what's called the quadruple lock on the Same-Sex Marriage Act which states that no religious organization can be compelled to marry same-sex couples. As I stated at the beginning of my talk, we must consider the meaning of social acts with reference to the historical context in which they occur. They don't occur in a vacuum. Many may welcome the prospect of disestablishment as a balancing of the scales between a dominant church and other religious minorities in Britain. But those are the terms of an earlier era, which was faced with challenges, divisions, and alliances distinct from our own. In the present moment, disestablishment, far from benefiting the non-established minority religious groups, will signify what many already believe, that the religious quest is irrelevant to public life, that the autonomy of religious groups is irreconcilable with the overriding normative principle of individual self-definition, and that religious expressions which do not actively affirm the principle of self-definition should be curbed on the basis that they denigrate a person's identity and they constitute status harm. Establishment where it already exists in a context of strong secularism is an imperfect but tangible bulwark against that worldview. Once it has been dismantled, we may reasonably expect the civil legislator to then turn its attention to trimming other incongruous vestiges of the past, which challenges its authority to define social norms, such as religious liberty and freedom of expression. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for such a provocative presentation. Uh, a lot of food for thought. Thank you so much, Professor Alexis. Now we have the, uh, the remarks for this session, and I think we are managing time here very well. So we will have some time for questions. That's a good news. Um, so prepare them already uh, as we um, listen to the, the, the final remarks by uh, Mr. Khalil Jamal. He comes from the Islamic 
community here in in Lisbon, yes, and is the representative of the Islamic uh, community in the interreligious dialogue uh, working group in Portugal. Uh, Mr. Khalil, the floor is yours, and we are looking forward for your remarks. Thank you very much. Shalom, Pax, Vobishkum, Assalamu Alaikum, may peace be upon you. Que a paz e a bênção de Deus estejam convosco. Allow me to start this short moment that it was gently conceived me with this uh, uh, courtesy formula or this salutation for all of you. I heard this when I was a kid, like uh, I would say a couple of years ago in the Islamic community of Portugal, mainly in the mosque with the president at that time, Abdul Vakil. Some of you that are here in the audience know him. I'm seeing some familiar faces that uh, testimony of these moments of interfaith dialogue that we experienced in the community for the last, uh, would say, three decades. Uh, and I do believe, and I started the purposely or deliberately with these uh, uh, many salutations in different languages to somehow express the environment or the peaceful environment that we have here in Portugal. Allow me to extend you a warm welcome to this lovely city that I hope uh, most of you know, and the joyful and this outstanding journey uh, that allows us the possibility to talk about religious freedom and bringing in these two days a uh, couple of sessions with these uh, many remarkable speakers as I had the possibility to experience here one more time and these lovely panelists. This concept of religious freedom seems to be a mirage sometimes, but it's not. Mainly regarding the fact that unfortunately it's not available in some part of the globe. But I do believe that Portugal is a good example of the religious freedom, mainly or due to several factors that I would like to highlight too. The first one, I would say attentious leaders, and this is not a simply compliment to our leaders in this field, but um, strong and attentious leaders that were able to express in a unique legal framework, the healthy environment that we testimony here, and we live locally, of respect and tolerance above all. And the mentality of the people, because the laws, as you can imagine, it's very, they are very important, but they, are not, they don't do their work without the cooperation of the people. Consider the fact that we were chosen by two international organizations to establish their headquarters in Portugal. I'm talking about the Imam Ismaili, His Highness Prince Aga Khan, and lately the Kai Seed that probably you heard about, and that brings on board for the very first time in the history Saudi Arabia and the Holy See as an observer state. I would like just to give you two or three ideas about my perception about the religious freedom and the dialogue and obviously highlight what our panelists said today. The first idea is like, I do believe that we have the perception that today there is an incompatibility between having a faith and respecting the diversity. In the name of the tolerance, taken sometimes to the extreme, we learn how to avoid, to affirm our convictions, afraid from hurting with things in a different way. Are the religious convictions less valuable simply because they aren't able to have mostly of the times attached to them scientific evidence or somehow pass through a lab test? This is a question that I, I, I let us for us to think. And we experienced in the pandemic uh, several situations that the science proved us that we had like commit some mistakes and through our mistakes we develop 
and, uh, and, 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 and evidence or scientific evidence regarding this. Despite we recognize a society or as a society the possibility to believe, sometimes we deny to the believers the possibility that this truth might be considered for them as an absolute truth and deserve the dignity to be shared by all. We do believe there is fundamental restitution of the dignity of the religious. Notice that I'm saying the, the, the religions, not the communities that obviously have their leaders. And as the human leaders, we have some mistakes and we commit some mistakes. Contradicting the idea that the religion doesn't have enough intellectual value. The equation is simple, my dear friends. Freedom brings dialogue, and dialogue enhances understanding. There is no success formula, and that's not what I'm going to bring you today here. But I would try to bring some ingredients to have a fruitful dialogue, since I'm doing this dialogue in the public radio of Portugal with two programs for the last nine years. The first ingredient is the dialogue should be sincere without ego, trying to don't have reason at any cost. This is very hard to do in practice. In theory, it's easy, but it's very hard to do it in practice. And the ego should be replaced by the protagonism of the sweetness of the truth. The truth should have a desirable sweetness that all of us should reach or try to reach. The purpose of the dialogue the second ingredient is the dialogue itself, and we should try to rescue the best values and the best argument of the others. This is very hard as well, because in discussions, we, I have the tendency to think that we want to have reason at any cost. And obviously, that will not bring a really good understanding between people. Third, don't be centered on yourself and on your fate and stop to compare each millimeter of your fate with the other. That will not lead to a successful result. The idea that our professor was saying here that we discuss ideas, we don't discuss people. And in the Pakistan example is really hard because somehow when some people are attached emotionally to their faith, to the principles of their faith, it's very hard to understand the attack that someone is giving. The attack, uh, I mean, it's not a proper attack, it's the, the, the argumentatively attack to my faith or to my arguments or to my ideas or the ideas of my religion is to attacking myself. No one is attacking myself. The, 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 how can I say, the nobility of the peoples are above everything. Avoid useless discussions, it's a wise principle. Um, I would like just to highlight two or three more ideas that it was sentenced here, and then obviously ending with something that I believe that it would bring some uh, reflection to all of us. Dr. John uh, highlighted us that, um, and I do believe that religions are vehicles to promote peace, but sometimes are instrumentalized. Um, and all three of them I do, I have a dialogue about the Abrahamic faiths, and three of them has points that might disagree with the general sense. So the idea is um, the religion should be instrumentalized and used as a vehicles to promote peace and to promote human fraternity. This is hard, and the challenge is to create somehow or try to create somehow and accommodate a legal framework that would give us the possibility to do this. But the big question the, is, the legal framework do the work itself, or we need to change the mentality of the people? Saramago, a Portuguese poet, used to say that to change a mentality in a society, we need more than 100 years. So ladies and gentlemen, the legal framework, even though it might be absolute perfect, 
we believe as believers that God is perfect, but the religions and the human beings are not, even if we create a perfect legal framework, we need also to try to cooperate and to act in the mentality of the people and to change the mentality of the people. The second question, uh, or the, the Professor Russell, uh, gave us two or three wonderful ideas about the contrast cycle that we are uh, living. Why we have this idea that in the 21st century we should live in an era that people would accept the difference and be enriched with the difference of each other. And surprisingly, we are reaching the opposite. That doesn't make sense for all of us. We live in a democracy, we should respect each other, but we do the opposite, or we have the perception that we are reaching an opposite, uh, an opposite uh, idea. We always have two interests contrasting. First of all, the expression, or the freedom of the expression, against the freedom of the religion. I would say that the most important is to train or somehow uh, train to respect the, the others. Because the respect, even though we do believe there is a magical formula, we need to train. It's not something easy and it's not something that's born with us. We do believe that it's something that's born with us, but it's not that easy. So first of all, we need to somehow try to demystify or deconstruct the cliches that we have normally associated with the religions. Uh, and the idea is somehow to try to reach the balance. And uh, the highlight that I extract from these wonderful uh, remarks is we do have to form the leaders as well. It's not enough to do and to create a good system, we have to somehow to sensibilize the leaders about these, all these issues and the, the, the questions that we are dealing with. The third moment with the professor Alexis is uh, showed us that even inside the congregations and the communities, we have mo movements inside and we don't think the same way during all the centuries or the decades inside the communities. This is good in one hand because give us the idea that we should somehow, the values of the religion should be dogmas and generally, normally they are dogmas, but somehow we should try to adapt not the values of the religion itself, but the approach to the moments and to the, the context that we live in nowadays. In this context, uh, he highlighted as the disaster that was, and we have several examples of the past, between the state and the religion. And the question for $1 million, I allow myself to say, is that the state should be neutral. What does it mean? and how we can create this formula of success. Ladies and gentlemen, for the time that I rest, I, I believe that is always extent. I would just to, uh, I would just to highlight, I would like just to highlight one example that I do believe uh, that it was, it, it marked somehow uh, my, it was, it was a recent episode that happened with me. And even though I, I do this dialogue for the last nine years, as I told you in the National Radio, it's a dialogue between a Muslim, a Catholic, and a Jewish. Uh, they told us that it's something unique that happened here in Portugal, and it would be very hard to do in some other parts of the globe. You can imagine the reasons why it would be that hard. And even though some people consider me as an expert that I reject the idea, we do commit mistakes. And the mistake that I committed and the lesson that it was brilliantly taught for me, it was when I visited Zanzibar one and a half year ago. I was on a honeymoon and I was obviously relaxed. And when I arrived Zanzibar to, with my wife, you know, I was recently married, uh, I had some ideas about the religious freedom and about the environment of religion that used to be lived there. So I asked the, the taxi driver that seems to be a very empathic person, a very gentle person, and I asked him, so uh, Tanzania is an Islamic country, right? And he told me, no, sir, we are an African country with a Muslim majority population. 
And that was the most brilliant lesson that I learned in the last days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khalil, for the, for the beautiful remarks and the way we have exposed and, and summarized what was shared by the, pre, your, the members here of the panel. So we have a few minutes to, to, for some questions. And we had a lot of prog provocative thoughts. So I think we have a lot to, to ask. Yes, please. Yes. Thank you. Right. Yes. Thank you so much to all the presenters because in, in some way they have given us a different um, perspective of uh, religious freedom, and mainly freedom of expression. I would, I would like to ask an, uh, Alexis and Rossell about uh, um, the importance of this establishment at church today. I understand that the 2K case is a very interesting I mean, uh, case uh, right now to think and reflect on the importance of the meaning of having a constitu constitutional church, the Anglican church, in the uh, in UK uh, system of government, right? Well, the point is that it is true that the controversy is uh, for and against the qualities between majority Anglican church and the minorities, right? But Beyond that, we realize that if the Anglican Church chose the option of establishment up to now, it's because they feel better protected by the state. What do the minorities think about it? Is there any reaction to this controversial concern in marriage right now? I mean, what do the other religious minorities think about the idea of having the Anglican Church disestablished. Concerning with this, I would like to, uh, to ask uh, Jaime Rossell about the importance of our, uh, I mean, our bishops, when they have to defend their own understanding, right, of gender issues, they do it because of their faith. They do it because of the dogma, of the Catholic dogma. It's, that's it. And that means that, uh, our system of uh, confessional church uh, should have protected them right now. I mean, as far as we got the separation between church and state, and because of our, our legislation in the last 30 years, okay, our uh, you know, leaders have had uh, less protection against that sort of claim concerning the courts of justice. Okay, my question is if the bishops and archbishops of England are protected better under this status than the Spanish bishops under our ecclesiastical or political status. Yes? Okay, thank you for your question. Maybe we will take uh, a couple more, and, and then we will answer to all of them at the same time. Yes, please, Ia. Yeah. Just use the metaphor of uh, Jean Graz when, when he spoke about a ceasefire on defamation. I would like to transform it into a question to all the participants, taking the example of the recent uh, Swedish uh, uh, incident of the burning of the Quran. If you were a religious leader, you are a religious leader, uh, what would be your role in such a scenario? What would you do? Thank you. Thank you. That's a practical question. And then a last one there, maybe. Yes, thank you. I have a question for Professor Arthur de la Ferriere. I hope not to slaughter your name too much. Um, your pres here, I'm here. <laughs> your presentation has been extremely thought-provoking since you um, gave it. I've been sitting here debating back and forth um, <laughs> how much I could follow your, your arguments. Um, part of me agrees with uh, your conclusions, parts of me aren't um, convinced yet. I don't know if that uh, indicates a multiple personality disorder. But um, I understand your basic uh, argument, I, I hope I understand your basic argument that uh, this establishment of the Church of England would marginalize religion at large, not just the Church of England. Um, but then I, 
I raise the question, is, shouldn't government structure and the legal framework reflect the actual circumstances in society? In other words, isn't religion already marginalized and the role of the Church of England in, in society? And shouldn't that be reflected in, uh, in the legal framework? Um, wouldn't, wouldn't it be a bit paternalistic um, of the state to do otherwise? Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So the floor is yours. Maybe I'll give three minutes to each one of you to share a little bit. Maybe Professor Alexis was more challenged. Maybe you can start. <laughs> uh, so is, is the Church of England privileged under establishment? Undoubtedly. Uh, I think there's 26 bishops sit in the House of Lords. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a number of ways in which it's privileged. Um, so that's what I... I and I think that has to do with the effect of establishment. I think it's privileged, it's unequal, uh, it's, I think, a historical anomaly. And yet, I think what it signifies in terms of the, the importance of what public life is for and the idea that civil authority should be subject to something other than itself. And I think that's very difficult for us to, uh, to, to institutionalize within a pluralistic society. Uh, I think the, s the search for, for meaning is something which uh, persists in a secularized society. And indeed, it manifests itself, I think one of the ways in which it manifests itself currently is in this strong insistence on individual autonomy and self-definition because in the absence of an, an external transcendental referent, we're kind of looking for an internal referent, but I think that creates, I, I, I think that, that's creating a certain crisis uh, of self. Um, so I think it's privileged, it's imperfect, but I think it's in some ways better than the alternative, like I say, it's a bulk work. And I think that's why you ask, do, do, do other minorities support disestablishment? Well, you know, if you were to poll them, you'd get you know, a whole range of opinions. But I do think that, you know, Javier earlier said, made the distinction between, you know, majority and minority religions, and that's certainly true. And at the same time, in a thoroughly secularized society like the UK, we're all minorities. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the things that the Church of England needs to come to terms with um, in terms of its, well, does it, will it, yeah. So, and um, should, uh, yeah, sh should the state reflect the actual status of society? I think in part that, that speaks to that distinction between effect and meaning. So th what it would mean, in a sense, it's an affirmation or it's a signification of what is already largely the case. So it would be kind of the stamp. Um, it would probably, there's kind of some sort of kind of circularity where it would reinforce that tendency. Um, but I'm not sure that, I don't think it's the case. Again, this is, I, I agree this is controversial, uh, but I don't think it's the case. I, don't, I certainly don't think it's obvious that the role of civil authority is just to reflect uh, passively, uh, the dominant trends in in society. Indeed, it doesn't do that, and indeed, the legislator doesn't think it's, it's doing that. Legislator actually is thinking that it's advancing towards a particular a particular norm, which is, is expressed in different sorts of ways. But I think I think it's is very well kind of expressed in, yeah, in kind of the kind of atom, the atomistic autonomy of the individual. And I'm not sure that that's really what the public uh, authority should be doing. I think it should be, again, oriented towards, uh, a, I don't know if I want to say transcendental, but a, uh, yeah, a sense of virtue, a sense of virtue ethics, a sense of the common good, which can't be uh, privatized or individualized. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. John? Uh, ju just, uh, I would like, you know, I should have mentioned that in my presentation. Uh, one of the answer is really the program you have initiated, you know, Face for Right. 
it uh, it gather everything we we could do you know put people together have the same goal meet each other talk about you know on the uh, framework of freedom and human right and encourage uh, religious leaders religious group to talk about and to be uh, to take part uh, in promoting you know all these aspects of freedom and human right and that's a fabulous program and i would like again to thank you uh, for doing that you know and thank you for your persistence and because you and you involve also so many university and uh, a lot of work to do has to be done at the level of university at the level of community you know we, we did a march every year and so on that's something that's really a very concrete and very good program to put people together behind, you know, as you mentioned, you know, individual behind what uh, people are thinking or ideology and so on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Javier? Yeah, uh, very, very shortly. I think, I think the problem is not that in Spain if we are prosecuting or not uh, bishops because their opinions about uh, gender ideology and, and, and so on. I think the question is that if uh, some, uh, some uh, political ideologies are trying to build a uh, civil ethic, if they are trying to uh, find some common values based only in the civil ethic, uh, we cannot uh, forget that uh, people are citizens but also are believers. So. If we are trying to find common values, we cannot expel the religious discourse of the debate. Because if you expel the religious discourse, you are limiting the religious freedom of part of your citizens. Because religious uh, freedom of expression is a human right, but also is part of the content of my religious freedom. So I think. We, we must try to reflect about uh, what kind of common values are looking for and if the religion must have a role in this debate. Okay. That I think is the point that I'm trying to put on the, on the floor. Thank, thank you, yes. Jamid, uh, a last comment, yes, please. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I would okay. pray with all my strength to not be in that position because it's a very sensitive and a very hard position. The thing is, um, as, a, as a religious leader, if that would happen in my country, the first thing that I would do, or the first measure that I would, I would try to implement, is try to somehow sensibilize the people why the Quran is so important and so untouchable for the Muslims. Because people might not understand that Quran is not just a simple book for the Muslims. We do believe that is the, the, the revelation that God himself gave to Muhammad through Jibrail or the, the, the Malaika, the angel Jibrail. So for us, that changes everything, you know, that's, that's the first thing. The second, obviously, the Muslims should be, um, I would not say more tolerant, because to be honest with you, the thing is, there is no, uh, I don't see religious, uh, I don't see freedom uh, of speech as an absolute value as I see life, for example. And this is, again, my perspective as a believer. Life, for me, it's an absolute value. Uh, freedom of speech, no. So somehow, in the name of the freedom of speech, we should not allow everything to be said. So there is some values, such as that for us it's very important and somehow untouchable and that uh, and that's very debatable because nothing should be untouchable in one hand but there is some things that should be object of respect i would say a universal respect it shocked me the same way that someone would burn the quran as they would burn the flag of my country and i am born and raised in portugal I'm not talking about the flag of Saudi Arabia, even though the flag of Saudi Arabia has the kalima that is my principle, my main principle as Muslim. So, 
if someone will burn the flag of Portugal, I would be as same as shocked as I would be if someone burned the Quran. But the thing is, debate or do the things, attack the religions in the level of the dimension of the ideas. That's acceptable. If you talk bad about the Prophet وسلم, even though it's hard for me to accept, even though it hurts me, I cannot say anything because we are talking about the discussion of ideas. But burning things and taking to into an action that somehow hurts me as a human being and hurts my dignity as the freedom that I have to practice my religion, for me, clearly cross the border. So I would advise any religious leader to somehow create some boundaries that we cannot cross. And obviously, uh, for the Muslims in that specific case, it was the Quran. Thank you for the exchange of ideas that we had. I think we can give a hand to these uh, wonderful panelists and we conclude here. Uh, João Martins for the fantastic moderation. Thank you to all the speakers for enlightening us and uh, pushing our mind to think about all the, that has been said. An amazing session. At the afternoon, we are going to see some practical cases. I invite you to be here at 2 o'clock sharp because we are going to have a first long session from 2 until uh, 3 uh, 45. We are going to start with a presentation. Uh, by our High Commissioner of, in Portugal for the um, uh, migrations about interreligious dialogue, and then three cases, studies from Germany, from Finland, and also um, about religious expression in the workplace. So it's going to be food for mind, for thought. Um, we are now going to separate ourselves. I know that some of you will want to visit the museum. I'm sorry, we didn't talk about getting a group ticket, so if uh, some of you want to do it, please go to the reception, buy your ticket, you have some, from, some free time. We will have lunch from 1 to 2 o'clock, so it's now half past noon. That means that if you come late for, for lunch, it's not too bad, because you had the option to go to the museum first. Okay? Thank you so much.